This is just a short term, uh, I call it the nightmare of agriculture, the nightmare of agriculture. This was in the 30s, 1930s. So if science and technology, it seems like, was about to bring uh, new abundance and leisure to the world. And who would want to go back? So the overall approach that he took, you know, the usual approach to develop a system is to say, how about trying this and how about trying that? He decided to go just the opposite direction. How about not doing this and how about not doing that? So he took it from all of these agricultural practices and he said, do we really need to do this? Or is this something we're doing just to, because we caused a problem and so now we're doing this and then we caused another problem and now we're doing that and eventually he decided there was no need to plow the fields I mean basic stuff no need to plow the fields no need to do weeding no need to make compost no need to flood the rice fields like every other farmer in Japan did in fact by the time I got to his farm which was maybe 30 years after he had been farming this way uh, there was very little that he did do, actually. He didn't prune. All he did was scatter seeds, sometimes encased in clay pellets. He scattered the seeds, spread straw, had a ground cover of clover, and he waited for the harvest. And in the orchard, it was a similar approach. When he got to the orchard, it was, the, it was eroded down to subsoil. So he enriched the soil using ground cover of clover and uh, deep-rooted plants like daikon and burdock and uh, dandelion and docks and so forth. And then he had radish and mustard and buckwheat and alfalfa and grains and comfrey and perennials. And then uh, he, he planted many different kinds of trees. And over time, this, after a very short time using his method, the soil improved to the point that he didn't have to fertilize. And at first, because there was no habitat for many of the insects, uh, he had to make natural insecticides like pyrethrum, which comes from chrysanthemum roots. And he had to spray that on his vegetables uh, in order to keep uh, things like cabbage worm and cabbage moss away. But after the, he established habitat for lots of different insects, then the natural balance made it so that he didn't have to worry about insect control anymore. See, so one thing after the other that he didn't have to do that nature took over. He grew rice during the summer and barley during the winter on the same field every year. And he spread the rice straw after it was harvested and threshed, he spread the rice straw back to mulch the barley field and he spread the barley straw to mulch the rice field. So he, he also thought that the straw would be effective for weed control. So when he first tried this, he took the barley and put it on the rice, but he kind of piled it on thickly and just in clumps, you know, just as the, you know, it came off the thresher. He piled it like that and it was very effective at weed control, but it was also effective at controlling the rice. The rice couldn't get through. So that year, he got a, his yield was about 20%. To him, that was a successful year because he saw in one corner, right where, they were the, right where he was taking the straw from the big pile and carrying it out to the field, in this one place, the straw had f fallen just here and there, scattered instead of plopped. And there the rice did fine. And the weeds were not coming up. He goes, aha, and that's what he learned from that year, yeah, it cost him. But, and now he just he scatters the rice every which way. I say now, he did, he passed away about four years ago. Okay, he scattered the rice every which way. And then he got the best of both worlds. He got the 
the mulch on the surface that was keeping weeds down and also the uh, breaking down and enriching. It's like a sheet composting system and still the rice came through, but n not the weeds, not so much. So, but I often hear that, you know, the, the Fukuoka's natural farming is, it's in a place, well, he did it in a place that's, that gets a lot more rainfall and significantly it gets a lot rainfall all during the summer, dependably, which of course in the Mediterranean climate, we don't here in California and on the west coast all the way up to uh, Puget Sound. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't practice natural farming here. So let's take the California Indians in different parts of California. You've got desert and you've got arid. That's true, but you've also got the coast. You've got the coast range and the redwood country, and you've got the islands off the shore. And the, so it's so varied. And there were maybe 60 main tribes in California, and each of them managed to live according to this basic way of thinking. They all had the same view of the world, but maybe 60 different forms of natural farming being practiced here. When Fukuoka did, he tried experiments, not experiments for experimenting sake alone and not to try to understand how nature worked, but he wanted to get answers to certain practical questions. Most people, when they try to figure out a system, they'll see what didn't work. They'll focus in on what didn't work and try to fix what didn't work because they have a clear idea what they want to do. Fukuoka took, again, the opposite approach. He had no idea where he was going, but he tried different things and he saw what worked and went that way. He kind of went with the flow of correct answers or, you know, it's not correct answer, but it's with what nature was showing him. And what didn't work, he ignored. He just didn't go that way. For example, he knew he wanted a, some kind of ground cover that fixed nitrogen in with his soil building mix. So he tried 30 different kinds. And of those, he found that clover and hairy vetch worked the best for him. And the, the, the white clover, only the white clover, has roots that mat right on the surface in the top two inches or so. So it was very good at uh, weed control. So he tried things and then, and he saw what worked. And then he goes, aha, this is it. Okay, so then he went that way and that way. He had no idea what the outcome was gonna be. What, he had no idea the goal. It was a journey to come back to nature, you know, and he referred to it as do nothing farming. But of course it has, it, that doesn't have to do with like literally not doing anything. It is letting nature take care of the insect control, the fertilizing, the irrigation, the, all of these things. And so um, the farmer really is doing much less. And he figured out how to do that by eliminating unnecessary work. That was sort of a tip off to him. If it, if it took a lot of effort, there's probably a better way to do it. So you're going to edit this? Yeah. yeah. That's nice. Um. And so this is a, this is a, you're filming, huh? That's a, yeah. funny how they look different now. That looks just like a camera. Yeah. Sorry about that. But you told me you're going to be able to edit. Yeah. So something like that is easy, right? Or like this.